I am, and I think I'm fortunate to have grown up Generation X, too. We got any Gen Xers in here? Yeah, I don't even care. <laughs> That's how Gen X I am. That's a calling card of our generation, right? It's not even dismissive to a Gen Xer. It's like, I don't care, I don't care also. Nice to meet you. <laughs> what generation are you? It doesn't matter, I don't care. That's the beautiful thing. That's the beautiful thing. If y'all don't like this joke, guess what? Yeah. <laughs> You're only gonna give me more cred as a Gen Xer. You'll only make me more powerful. <laughs> but we are a lucky generation. We're the only generation currently alive that didn't spend our youth with America at war. Think about that. Boomers had Vietnam. Millennials, everybody after. Afghanistan, we had this long stretch of relative peace. I mean, George Bush sent a few guys to Kuwait for like a long weekend. It's like, all right, was that a war? <laughs> not by American standards, that was not a war. <laughs> Felt like more of an excursion, to be honest. <laughs> By the way, we had the best George Bush Generation X. We had the George Bush that wore glasses and had exit strategies. <laughs> that was a better model of George Bush. In Gen X, we call that George Bush Classic. <laughs> but it's easy to spot that we're a lucky generation because we're sandwiched between the two most dynamically angry generations currently alive. We are. Boomers and millennials hate each other. They do. I hear it all the time. It's like, you're an idiot. No, you're an idiot. I'm like, hey, you're both right. <laughs> Chill out. <Just> chill out. <laughs> but I get it. I get why they're two angry generations, because these are two generations experience these huge swings between human achievement and human disappointment, right? Boomers established civil rights, fair housing, but in order to get there, there were assassinations, race riots, KKK. Millennials elected the first black president in American history, and then they elected the next president, <laughs> who brought back race riots in the KKK. I mean, it's just a full circle. And then in the middle, Gen X, we just watched Soul Train and listened to hip hop and fell in love with Oprah and all the Michaels. <laughs> It was a great generation for Michaels in America. We had Tyson, Jordan, Jackson. Generation X had the best Michael Jackson. We had Moonwalk Michael Jackson. That is the greatest Michael Jackson ever. Boomers, you had little Michael Jackson, Jackson 5, cute, talented, but nowhere near thriller level Michael Jackson. Millennials, y'all had documentary Michael Jackson. No. That is, that is a confusing applause point, I gotta be honest with you. <laughs> but that's the thing, millennials had the worst of a lot of things they did. Millennials introduced ghosting to the world as a way to end a relationship. In Gen X, ghosting just meant that Demi Moore's boyfriend had to die to become remotely interested in her pottery hobby. <laughs> And I hear people criticize millennials for being the participation trophy generation, but I have to remind them, this is a generation that grew up in the shadow of 9-11. They graduate college at the 08 financial crash, they finally climb out of their parents' basement, and the whole world just shuts down for two years. They experience a lifetime flood, or fire, or recession, almost every year. <laughs> if that's what they've got to participate in, give them a trophy, just give them a trophy. <laughs> I'm glad some of them are still participating, to be honest with you. Because I think the key to understanding a generation is you gotta understand the world that they grew up in. People say millennials are self-involved. We're all self-involved. It's just that millennials learn to embrace it and that's disturbing to the rest of us. I understand that. But it's not a character flaw, it's a product of their environment. Think about it, millennials grew up with GPS. Every time they went on a journey, sitting next to them with this robot navigation butler just whispering <laughs> precise step-by-step -step instructions in the soothing voice of their choosing. <laughs> and then when they look at the map, it's telling them that they are the center of the universe. <laughs> no matter how far they go or which direction they're headed, they're just this bright blue orb of hope that the entire world just arranges itself around. <laughs> That's gonna mess with your sense of self, it is. And of course it's gonna irritate boomers because every time they went on a trip, the thing giving them directions was a disappointed spouse or parent. <laughs> and not in the voice of their choosing, but in the voice they hated most in the whole world. 
That's why boomers will never be fully comfortable around the GPS. It's just too nice. <laughs> Have you ever been in the car with a boomer and a GPS at the same time? It is a fight to the death. <laughs> that is navigational Highlander in that car. I'll be driving down the road with my mom and that GPS is like, turn right and a thousand feet. And my mom's like, don't you do it. Don't you dare turn right. I'm like, Mom, I love you, but I'm gonna go with the thing that can see traffic from the sky today. That's how we're doing this journey. <laughs> but I understand her perspective, too, as a boomer. Because when boomers went on trips, they had to know things. They had to have skills. They had to start preparing the night before by unfolding a map that was sometimes the size of their house. <laughs> And the first thing they had to do was figure out where they even were on the map. <laughs> Think about that. If every time you went on a trip, your first step was to find yourself. <laughs> do you realize the level of existential stability that requires? That's why every time a boomer reaches their destination, their first 10 minutes of conversation is just, how did you get here? <laughs> But I grew up Generation X, one foot in both worlds. I knew technology was great, but also stupid, because I had MapQuest. <laughs> yeah, I had to start preparing the night before too, but just by printing out 28 pages. <laughs> and the first 17 of them were just to get off the street that I lived on. <laughs> That's stupid. That's stupid. <laughs> but I understand. I understand, Generation X, we were in that sweet spot in American history. After the boomers had taught us to just say no, but before millennials had taught us that no meant no. <laughs> so we were having a good time, we were. Because millennials know so many things and they care about so many things. And boomers, you know like 10 things. And you only care about four of them. And Gen X, I grew up going to schools filled with lead paint and asbestos, and I thought the things I should fear most were Y2K and quicksand, so... <laughs> I feel like all of that was a lie. <laughs> because it's about your access to information. These are three generations that are defined by that access to information. Boomers, three channels, that's not nearly enough information. Somebody's gonna gaslight you. <laughs> Millennials. YouTube, that's way too much information. You're gonna gaslight yourself. <laughs> generation X was a generation that realized that 200 channels is the perfect amount of information for the human brain to process without imploding on itself. Yeah, we had a big bird and a crime dog and a bear that was trying to pin the blame for forest fires on us. <laughs> Our guns had roses. Our baloney had a first name. It was a nice... It was a nice era of information, it was. <laughs> and that's why we understand that millennials and boomers will never fully be able to connect with each other. They won't. These are two vastly different generations. Boomers experience Spider-Man only as a comic book, and millennials think that his superpower is that every time he takes off his mask, he's a different actor. That's too big of a chasm, it is. So I feel like it's my job to translate between the generations. I have those conversations. I talk to my dad about gender. Yeah, this is a thing that his whole life was a true false question. And I had to tell him, no, it's an essay now. <laughs> this is a man who gave up on technology when DVDs came out, okay? He is not ready for this conversation all by himself. <laughs> to tell him that gender is on a spectrum, he grew up watching black and white television. He didn't even realize color was on a spectrum until he was in college. <laughs> now I gotta tell him there's a lot of things on the spectrum. Gender, most of my friends in comedy, it's a wild world out there, it really is. <laughs> His favorite athlete, Bruce Jenner. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. I had to sit my father down and explain, Bruce Jenner no longer exists. <laughs> He's like, Bruce Jenner's dead? I'm like, no, way more complicated, way more complicated. <laughs> but he asked questions. He asked questions, and I credit him for that. He did. Some of them were easy. He's like, how do you spell Caitlin? I'm like, don't worry about it. I don't think anybody knows how to spell Caitlin, to be honest. <laughs> 
But he asked me about gender reassignment surgery, and that is a much harder question. It is. And I can't possibly understand fully the plight of a transgender person in America. But I did grow up Generation X with the gender fluid music of Boy George, David Bowie, Prince. <laughs> so I might not understand what you're saying, but I'm still going to listen because I'm not missing the next Purple Rain. I swear, I'm not. <laughs> So I tried to explain it in terms he would understand. He's like, what's gender reassignment surgery? I'm like, it's sort of like Uncle Andy. <laughs> Uncle Andy had gastric bypass surgery. <laughs> a transgender person looks in the mirror. They're like, I don't feel like the person I see in the mirror. And one day Uncle Andy looked in the mirror. He's like, I don't feel like a heavy person. I feel like a slender person. And then he went and had surgery and he became a slender person. It's basically gender reassignment, Dad. It's basically. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Andy's essentially transgender, but with cellulite. <laughs> now, was that an oversimplification? Yes, of course it was. But it taught him what he needed to know about the subject. Because now when he hears the term transgender, he doesn't get angry about some random public restroom somewhere in America. <laughs> He thinks about the time he went fishing with Uncle Andy. He's like, I don't know, I'm okay with it, whatever. <laughs> I mean, it did get weird the first time he saw Uncle Andy after that. Because I think he conflated both of those things into one thing. He just walks up, he hugs him, he's like, you can use whatever bathroom you want while you're here. <laughs> Like, I'm pretty sure that's how all the bathrooms work in our house anyway, Dad. <laughs> I think he called his shirt a blouse a few times. He may have used the term translender. I can't remember. 